Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, the first speaker, Professor Khalid Haq, who will be joining us on Zoom. Uh, you know Professor Khalid Haq very well. He's reti he retired as Professor of Neurology and Director of Research and Development, St. Helens University Hospital Trust, UK. He is currently visiting faculty and Professor of Neonatal Medicine to the Children's Hospital, Lahore, Pakistan. He is Chairman of QAAC of PPA Neurotology Group and lead a team of neurotologists who develop template and standard of neurotal registration in Pakistan. He has more than 52 years of pediatrics and neurotology experience and has mentored most of the senior neurotologists in this country and abroad. He has published about 200 peer-reviewed papers, authored many textbooks, and also a review, reviewer of multiple international journals. Please welcome Professor Khalid Haq for his talk on development and shaping of brain, my perspective as a neurotologist. Professor Khalid Haq. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? I am very grateful for the kind words which you have said, and also the kind words which were said by the Dean, Professor Sajid Makbul, and Professor Irfan. I really don't deserve any of that. I'm very grateful for Irfan and Javeria to invite me to participate in this Neo Curriculum 2021. I plan to talk about the development and shaping of the brain as my perspective as a neonatologist. This is the scene from my study window when I recorded the presentation earlier, two days earlier, but this is much better that I'm speaking to you live. It is in fact a great logical thing to talk about human brain and neonatal neurology. Because for us humans, it is all about the brain anyway. Weight for weight, we have the largest brain amongst all mammals. And not only that, our brain is the only brain among mammals which continues to grow after birth. So what I plan to do in the next 25 minutes or so is that to set the scene for the eminent speakers who are going to follow. I will talk about basic anatomical development of the brain, that is neurulation, cortical development, neurogenesis, what's happening inside the developing brain, neuronal cell development and migration, development of connections, connectivity, de development and importance of functional networks, and then I'll address some clinical issues that are not being addressed in this colloquium. I will point out the importance of cerebellum in neonatal neurology. And if time permits, I'll talk a little bit about vascularity, its development and fragility. But if I don't have time, I'm sure Professor Shahid Mahmood is going to address this issue. I have no conflict of interest. Let's start. Autogeny of brain development is rather complex. And for simplicity, and only for simplicity and description, I have divided it into six different parts. Neurulation, cortical development and neuronal cell development, that is the shaping of the cerebral cortex, formation of neurons, which is highly dependent on many neurotrophic factors. And I've just picked up two, the insulin growth factor one, and leukemia inhibitor factor because they are of interest of re recent research and I'll come back to those. I'll talk about neural migration because the neurons once developed need to go to the right place. I'll talk about myelination because myelin neurons need to transmit information with speed and for that they require myelination. Talk about synaptogenesis that is making the right connections, just like you and I have to make right connections. And then a little ap ap apoptosis, because we produce 
far too many neurons than we need, we need to destroy some of them. And this gives you the, the plasticity of the newborn brain. And I want to stress once again that these, though for simplicity I've separated them, all these factors are working together and are interacting with each other. Now, if you happen to be born prematurely, then of course you might miss out on this development or have partial development or have abnormal development in the, all these areas. And this is what I'm going to talk about. So let's start with new relation. That is the formation of the brain. The neural plate appears on the 13th day of gestation from the ectodermal layer. And within two weeks, you can start seeing the for, uh, rudimentary formation of brains and the neural canal. By the time the fetus is four weeks, you can clearly see and identify the forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain, and, and the spinal cord. Another few weeks later, you can see the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves developing. And by 11 weeks, all the elements of the central nervous system are present. Obviously, if something goes wrong during this period, you will get neural tube defects like an encephaly, spina bifida, or encephalocele, which I'm sure Professor Zishan is going to address, uh, address in his, uh, in his, uh, in his workshop. I will concentrate on cortical growth and neuronal growth. Cortical growth from 11 weeks or 12 weeks of gestation to about 34 weeks of gestation, the brain grows steadily. But suddenly, from 34 weeks onwards, the brain goes very, very rapidly. And from then, that is 34 weeks to term, gestation, 70% of the cortical gray matter and white matter develops. Brain size and volume increases three folds and the surface area of the brain increases four to six folds during this period. Thus making this last six weeks of gestation extremely important for you and I and for every baby who is born. And if you happen to be born before 34 weeks, 34 weeks, you're likely to have a problem in this area. What is happening during this period? Well, of course, if you look at these sections of the brain, at 22 weeks, it's just got four lobules, it's dark and gray, because it is full of gray matter. As the brain increases in size and shape, it, the gray matter convolutes in itself and folds inside and gets deeper and deeper to make space for white matter till it is concentrated in the basal ganglia, caudate nucleus, and the thalamus, and of course, the cortical margins. And you can see this very well in the T1 weighted images where the 23 weeks, the brain is small, gray, and dark. And as the, the brain development can, uh, proceeds, you see more and more of white matter in a term. In fact, most of the brain is white matter. So 35% of the brain actually develops in the last six weeks of gestation. 60% of the white matter develops in the last six weeks of gestation. So what does this mean for a preterm baby who misses out on this exponential increase in volume and size? is that the brain of a baby who is born before 34 weeks is small, is lighter, in, and is, is much smaller in volume. More importantly, it has poor or smaller surface area. The reason being the sulci and gyri are not formed as well as the term infant, and the sulci which are formed are also shallower. And they also have reduced white matter here at 34 weeks and here at term. Now, Century and others have shown that neonatal intensive care per se has a major negative impact on the cortical growth and maturity. Therefore, what we as the new preterm infant actually suffers from a double whammy, has poor growth of the brain, and then 
these are the babies who are more likely to receive intensive care, have a problem with suppress their brain, brain growth even further. Now, as I said, the brain changes from gr mainly gray matter to white matter. And then at the end, in term, and you and I, 40% of the brain is gray matter, but 60% is white matter. Whilst the gray matter is smaller in amount, it still is the center of, uh, of activity. It is where is this central motor where everything starts from. It conducts and processes the, and sends all the information and it uh, contains all the neuronal cell bodies. Whilst white matter are basically like tracks and motorways which transmit the messages from gray matter to other parts of the gray matter and to other parts of the body. But nevertheless, white matter is 60%, so it's important. And therefore, I just want to spend 30 seconds talking about white matter. White matter and neuronal maturation is dependent on many neurotropic factors. And I've pointed out the two. Vass from Netherlands and Lynn from New Jersey have shown that both uh, IGF-1 and LIF, uh, leukemia inhibitory factor, are low in preterm babies. What does this mean? If they are low, that means that the white matter develops poorly, the neuronal development is poor, and therefore this white matter is predisposed to injury. And I know that Talal and uh, Junaid are going to talk about white matter injury through encephalopathies and through brain, ma ma brain injury talks just after uh, I finish. But what I want to point out is the recent development. Giving IGF or LIF and or both of them helps repair injury and helps the development of white matter. The problem is, okay, we can now have growth, neurotropic growth factors which can repair injury, but how do you get them to the, to the neurons which are damaged? Olga Sindiva from London, using targeted delivery in the form of microcapsules, bringing in loaded with growth factors, brings in directly to the needed location and repair the damaged neuron. It's just like if you and I break down on a motorway, we call AAA and they come and fix our car and we are on our way. So these microcapsules will contain a whole load of uh, neurotrophic factors which they can deliver to the damaged neuro. Then the next problem, of course, is where is the da damaged neuron? Now we have reached enough diagnostic precision of white matter that we can not only see white matter injury on scans, as Professor Qureshi, I'm sure, will be talking to you, but we can actually map the white matter injury and we can quantify the white matter injury to great, such a great precision that this specificity is between 97 and 100 percent. And therefore, this is a major, major advance in neonatal medicine where we can now not only see where the injury is, but we can also map it and quantify it so that we can determine what kind of uh, insult or handicap this child will have, so we can target his, his or her rehabilitation and also give parents proper advice. But what worries me a little bit is in our practice, we all know that infection and hypoxia and ischemia, which Sajad is going to talk about and vascular accidents cause white matter injury. But what worries me is some of the medications which we use and nearly all, and this is Kushal's work, show that all anticonvulsants, nearly all anticonvulsants increase apoptosis of white matter. And therefore, I know Irfan is going to talk about neonatal seizures just after this, but we have to be very careful what anticonvulsants we use and for how long do we use them. Coming to neuronal development, the nerves develop in bouts. They have a period of very rapid growth, then they rest and they start growing fast again. And these are the critical periods. And of course, the injury during this critical period will cause severe uh, in, uh, insult and severe, uh, lead to severe handicap. We've all seen babies who had a similar insult, but one has got devastating handicap and the other is perfectly normal. 
And that may be because the one who is handicapped got the injury in the cortical period while the other got it during the resting phase. As far as neuronal development is concerned, again, for simplification, I have divided them into five parts, neurogenesis, myelination, neural migration, synaptogenesis, and network formation. As you all know, and this is basic, very basic, that the neuron developed from the neuronal stem cells in the peri deep in the periventricular area, just anterior to the caudate nucleus. They develop from the neuron stem cells, and then they travel upwards towards the cortex. When they reach the intermediate zone, they differentiate into new, uh, the neurons and the glial cells. The glial cells act as guide wires on which the neurons will travel upwards. In the subplate area, the neurons differentiate into the kinds of neurons they are going to be. For example, motor neurons, sensory neurons, or interneurons. They also determine whether they are going to be multipolar. That means whether they are going to transmit information upstream and downstream, or they're going to be unipolar and transmit information only in one direction, either downstream or upstream. The beauty of the interneurons is that though they are not myelinated, they transmit information in all directions. They are multipolar, they transmit information upstream, downstream, right, left, and center, and they are mainly found in the cerebellum. Once the neurons reach the cortical area, there they make all the synapses and the connections and formation uh, and, uh, and form, form connect, connective networks. Because as I said, there are too many neurons to our use, we end up uh, destroying some of them from apoptosis. Next stage is myelination. The, the neurons wrap themselves up with layers and layers of fat. And the reason for that is that the more the layer, the fat, the more the myelination, the faster the speed of transmission. As you can see, the speed of transmission is much faster in a myelinated nerve than in an unmyelinated nerve. But what is exciting is the work which we have we've seen in the last five years from Reynolds and Belsler that delayed cord clamping and early breast milk exposure to all newborns, be they preterm or term, increases myelination and connectivity. It increases the cortical mass, volume and surface area, particularly of the gray matter of the brain, thalamus and caudate nucleus. Which, is, which are responsible for our sensory, motor, and conscious and higher executive function. This is Belzler's work showing the more the duration, longer the duration of breastfeeding, the greater the myelin content of the nerve. And you can see that the greater the myelin content, the greater the connectivity, which is seen. Here is a baby who's not breastfed and the connectivity is weaker, whereas a baby who is breastfed totally has higher connectivity. We then come to we then come to neuronal migration. And this is a very important uh, element of neuronal development. The neurons, as, as I've said, form in the deep in the periventricular area, interior to the caudate nucleus. From there, they have to migrate to all parts of the brain. The first two migrations start around 31 weeks to the sensory motor cortex and to the parietal and temporal cortex, because that's what the baby needs, a motor ability and also the ability of perception. But I want to concentrate a little bit and tell you to please hold on to this prefrontal cortex uh, migration. This starts a little later at 34 to 35 weeks. And this is the area to the prefrontal cortex, the area which is responsible for our higher executive function decision-making, behavior, and personality. And I'll come back to this on my, in my last slide, why this migration to the prefrontal cortex is so important for the newborn baby. Next is, of course, synaptogenesis, that is formation of connections. Because neurons have information, but if you don't connect the dots, that information cannot be transformed into knowledge. And neurons need to connect to transmit information because if you don't do that, you will not transform that into knowledge. And you know, I wonder that our grandmothers and our mothers used to 
tell stories and lories and sing to us when we were uh, babies. And that is the stimulation which is required. And we have now changed that we now, in the West, of course, it is changing. We are allowing mothers and parents to come in and hold the babies and sing and read to them. Uh, in the neonatal units I've seen in Pakistan, parents are rarely allowed, or if they are allowed, they're not allowed in intensive care, and they're not allowed to handle, uh, handle babies. And if you don't allow, stimulate the baby and just let the baby lie in the incubator, then of course the connections will not form. And it's the famous saying, use it or lose it. So if you don't use your neurons and you don't form connection, you will lose them. Why is uh, connections important? The reason is that they form connectomes and you form ne functional networks. There are many, many networks in, uh, in the brain. I've listed a few here. Visual, auditory, sensory, language, attention, salience, default. These, neuro uh, these networks function are very rudimentary and fragile in the newborn, but as we get older, and as in life, we form much closer in, in, and integrated networks and much more denser networks. The networks actually work like this. They have two basic areas, task active network and task negative act, uh, uh, network with a connect term in the middle. So if I give you an example, let us say a visual network, you see a car and you recognize it's a Toyota. The task negative uh, network says, okay, it's a car, it's Toyota, that's the end, and we stop and we start to move. Uh, the visual network starts to see something else. But children who are of autistic spectrum have not a single connectome, but multiple connectomes. And thus, there is too much crosstalk and too much interference making their decision making or processing of information very, very difficult because there are so many messages going at the same time. It's a Toyota, it's a car, it's a cycle, it's a motorcycle. That's the information which is going. We have a slightly other problem in growth restricted babies. It's not that they, they, they have the uh, abnormal networks, they just do not have enough fibers to make networks and therefore they have paucity of functional networks. I think I've covered the basics of brain development and phasing. I just want to come to some practical aspects of neonatology. I'd like you to consider you are checking into a hotel where the room are made of glass, the light is never shut off, you are asked to sleep on a hard bed, you are wired up from your hand, feet and chest for security purposes. Only occasionally the man manager comes and puts, draws the curtain, but otherwise the light is on and there is a hissing noise all the time in, the, in, in your room. Then of course the uh, hotel uh, staff come in and prick you from time to time, hourly, two hourly or three hourly, and if they're very generous, six hourly. And of course, the other staff come and wake you up to make sure that you, you're not in deep sleep. How would you like to check in into such a hotel? And that's exactly what we do in our neonatal intensive care. And this brings me to the point of pain. And pain is mainly perceived at the, th at the thalamic reach. And thalamus, as I've shown you, is important for sensory motor and language and personality development. Emma Durden from Toronto Sick Kids has done uh, scans at 20, of 24-32 weekers, at, uh, two to six weeks after birth, then again near term, and then again at 34-36 weeks and followed them up. And just looking at the thalamus, what she has shown that the more the pricks the baby has, the smaller the volume. The functional area of the thalamus reduces. The shape of the, of the thalamus reduces. Skin breaks increase, the thalamus size goes down. Now, every time we are pricking the baby, we are damaging his or her thalamus. I'd just like you to think about that. But then, of course, the great neonatologists will come and say, well, no, we are actually very good. We try and prevent pain. 
And particularly when we are ventilating babies, we give morphine. Now, Zucker has shown that as morphine accumulates in the brain, the cerebellum shrinks. Here you are, the cerebellar size and the morphine. As morphine is in, uh, accumulating, uh, in, in the cerebellum is shrinking in size. I've had uh, a discussion on the academic uh, WhatsApp chat. Some people are using midazolam. Even worse, midazolam actually actively induces neuronal apoptosis of the hippocampus, which is the band center. Some people turn around and say, well, we are now using paracetamol. Paracetamol causes necrosis and reduces functional network. Fentanyl, McPherson has shown it is associated with a slightly higher incidence of intraventricular hemorrhage. Well, you turn around and say, we don't use any medications. We use glucose and sucrose. Very good, excellent. That is the way to go. But if you make, keep the blood sugar on the higher side, then the basal ganglia development is affected. So hyperglycemia is bad, and it is particularly bad for female babies. This is this slide I want to stress a little bit because this is again Julian Schneider's work from Lausanne in Switzerland, where she has shown that if you ventilate the baby and not give them enough energy, and I've seen many, many units in Pakistan who have got 10, 12 different kinds of ventilators and are ventilating babies right, left, and center, but do not have TPN or parenteral nutrition and cannot provide enough energy. And some units actually I have visited have, do not feed their babies while they are being ventilated. And you can see that if you do not provide energy, the cerebral volume and the brain cortex actually shrinks. And this does not happen if you provide enough energy. I have talked about Emma Durden's work. She has taken it further. It's not only just energy, but it's mainly protein. The, as you increase the protein intake, the strength of the thalamus and the ne functional network increases in a straight exponential line. And as this strength of thalamus and functional network improve, the processing speed of information improves. Recently, from work from China has shown that T lymphocytes from the gut in, in necrotizing enterocolitis can cross the blood-brain barrier and go and destroy, the, uh, unmyelinate or demyelinate uh, the neuronal, uh, neuronal cells and the functional networks. And here is the, the normal, here is the destructed functional network. And here you can see the demyelination secondary to T lymphocyte-mediated uh, destruction. So the dilemma I face in practice is what do I do? I want to reduce pain because it's bad for the thalamus, it's bad for brain function. I can't use morphine because it affects the cerebellum and the glial tissue and affects cognitive function. Medazolam, paracetamol, fentanyl all cause problems. But these are the only weapons I have. So what do I do? Perhaps I can use them more thoughtfully. But what I can do and should do is to improve the environment and reduce the painful events for our baby. Feed breast milk, provide adequate energy at all times, particularly during periods of stress and ven like ventilation. Prevent hyperglycemia and NEC and use medications like aminoglycosides and anticonvulsants with care and thought. And I say, as I said, I just want to introduce you to this small little brain which is stuck down in the posterior fossa. The work from uh, using uh, diffuse tensor imaging from Professor Council and Mary Rutherford in King's College Hospital London have highlighted the importance of cerebellum because cerebellum has connections, fibrous connections to all parts of the brain. And if these connections don't work, the cerebral cortex will not develop. Therefore, cerebellum is extremely important for cortical development and brain development as a whole, and not only um, balance as we are taught in medical school. 
Unfortunately for us, the neonatologists, we tend to use the anterior fontanelle as a window, but forget to use the mastoid, mastoid window to see the cerebellum. These are two pictures from Linda DeWeer's uh, work showing grade one hemorrhage and grade two hemorrhage. These would be given as very good prognosis, but when you looked at their cerebellum, you can see the petechial hemorrhages with devastating effect. Again, with cerebellum uh, and uh, diagnostic precision, has, we have achieved so much that we can now actually detect where the abnormality is, what the abnormal injury is, and what it is effect it is going to have so that we can target our treatment and also counsel parents accordingly. I don't have time to talk about vascularity, but just to show you Wigglesworth's work, how fragile and, positive, uh, and few the blood vessels are at 26 weeks compared to term. I'd like to finish off by saying we have seen improvement in the West. We now, above 30, 31 weeks, virtually have 100% survival and cerebral palsy rates have gone down to very low, less than 1%. But what has not changed, and this is the point I was making about the migration to the prefrontal cortex, is that babies who are born prematurely at 24, 28 weeks or up to 32 weeks have a much higher incidence of psychiatric disorders, stress-related disorders, mood disorders, or even they have much higher incidence of uh, committing suicide later on in life. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to finish off by saying autogeny of brain development is a dynamic process that starts early in gestation and continues long after birth. Brain development and its shaping are vulnerable to many internal and external insults. Whilst our diagnostic precision has improved dramatically, many of our practices do not pay adequate attention to the developing brain. Feeding mother's breast milk and reducing painful experience offers the best form of neuroprotection. Over the years, preterm survival and neurocognitive morbidity has improved, but long-term neuropsychiatric outcome has not changed. Biology gives us a brain, environment turns it into a mind. I hope this talk will make you think brain, think cerebellum, think breast milk, and the environment in your neonatal unit while caring for neonates. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Khaled Huck, for the wonderful presentation and perception you shared with us.